successful you are, your second album uh, is often just a huge flop. And I, I think, you know, I spent 10 years in the clubs before we made it. So I always sort of felt like I had these, I have these very vivid memories of being an unemployable bum and, and feeling like it's always around the corner, you know? So even, so, so just to, just to go back, we were talking about, before I started recording, we were talking about your being sort of thinking a lot about like what makes the most sense for the money in New York real estate. You've created um, an indoor airport, basically inside your apartment, inspired by Gatwick. Um, and, and I just want to talk about this because it is very true that most people, most artists don't make it, right? I mean, they get to make the art, but they don't make it financially in ways that we think of when we think of the most successful people. Um, but you actually have been doing it for 30 years in terms of the Counting Crows and more in terms of like your early days as a musician. So you're literally like, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's ridiculous. The odds were so against you even buying this apartment ever in New York City based on all who came before you, but you did it. Well, I mean, I've been doing it for 40 years now, but only, but the first 10, you know, we were just in the clubs. I was in clubs playing songs in various versions of various bands. And, you know, I had a good long time doing it to come to the realization, plenty of time to come to the realization that it wasn't going to work as far as, you know, becoming a rock star, becoming like financially successful and for my head and to get it in my head that it was time to do something else. And, and most of my friends did. Most of my friends who were very, very talented, a lot of them, you know, came to the realization that it was time to get on with their lives. And I just didn't want to stop. I mean, I just think, felt like this was who I was. And so I kept doing it. But, you know, and 10 years into it, because I was 27 the first time anyone from a record company even came to look at a band I was in. I was 28 when we got signed. I was 29 when our first album came out. Um, I turned 30 uh, about a year later in the middle of our first big summer tour. Um, so it was, you know, I wasn't a kid when it happened. I had been, you know, and it's been 30 years since then now, um, almost. So, yeah, I mean, I think maybe that's part of the reason we're still here in some ways is that I'm always thinking it was going to be over. And so it's always important to work and do more and do more. And cause otherwise it just doesn't last. It's, I don't understand how to explain that it does with us because I have so many friends who are very, very good and it either never happened for them or it happened very briefly. I mean, and you know, we're not as successful as we once were, obviously uh, we're still, you know, we can still do, you know, you know, somewhere between three to four and 10 to 15,000 at every gig for a summer, uh -huh. you know, between three and, you know, something like that, less overseas maybe, but. We're talking we're about dollars. Well. We're talking about people in seats. People. Or yeah, people yeah. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, not people dollars. Concert. People. You know, we, we can make $3,000 yeah. every summer. <laughs> yeah, With I mean, paper I don't work. Know. I have a lot of friends who are in that realm, though, and are still doing it. You know, they play yeah. and their gigs don't, you know, if they break even, they're lucky, you know. It'd be Well, you know, this being an artist is uh, not, it has to be about something other than just financial success, because that is just too rare to depend on, you know. Well, also, I mean, you came up, you know, I have a lot of guests on this podcast, many came into their own before social media and many sort of came up through social media. And so a lot of the people who had access to social media started younger, sort of broke through younger, had a way in which their, the thing they were making got in front of millions of eyeballs really quickly, right? We call that going viral. You actually went viral before any of that was possible, before the internet, before that was the way that people all over the world were talking about the same thing. Um, let me do something very unorthodox. Because we started talking, because you're so charming and funny and immediately engaging, um, I want to just read the very short intro that I was going to do at the beginning for the four people listening on the planet who aren't exactly sure 
who we are yet. I'm going to tell them who you are in a second. Um, and then we're going to go back to this conversation. But let me just tell you all, you've been listening to Counting Crows lead singer, songwriter, composer extraordinaire, Adam Duritz. Adam and the band exploded onto the music scene in 1993 with their multi-platinum breakout album, August and Everything After. The band has gone on to release seven studio albums selling more than 20 million records worldwide and is revered truly as one of the most preeminent live touring rock bands for the last 30 years. Their latest record, Butter Miracle Sweet One was released in May of 2021, but little known fact, is that the few times I've had the privilege of talking to Adam in person has been at the theater. Most recently, I was seated next to him at the opening of Company on Broadway. And then a few years back at the public theater, I think it was the opening of Take Me Out. Then we were at Moliere oh, wow. in the Park. Yeah, remember that? A long time ago, yes. God, yeah. Dominic was in that and, and um, one of the first things I saw him do, Dominic Bermusa, my husband, who, who Adam hosted recently for a Super Bowl, uh, viewing and my husband came home very dejected about the game, but more in love with you than ever. So it balances out, I guess. Um, so I just want to officially welcome you, global rock star and theater geek Adam, to the podcast. Um, just to contextualize a little bit all the ways in which we meet in terms of our passions. Um, another thing that I I did is I started listening to your podcast. Um, underwater sunshine, because I find if I can find content like that, that my guests are making themselves, I get to hear sort of so much about who they are in their own voice um, in an organic way. And so one of the things that sort of came to the forefront pretty quickly was how much you traveled as a kid, how much your family moved around the world or, or around the country of America, I should say. Yeah. And so Unlike some of my guests, I don't think you're a military brat, are you? Part of it, yeah. Part Texas. of it is. Okay, so what did your parents do? I know you have a sister that had you sort of in a station wagon moving from state to state all the time in your earlier life. Well, my dad is a neonatologist um, to high-risk newborn babies, and he's was one of the pioneers in that field, one of the first probably hundred in existence. Um, and they had me when they were pretty young. So I was born when he was in college. Um, and then, I mean, he did, he was getting his PhD and his undergrad at the same time. He did a pharmacology PhD. I think he did some of the original research on the effect of alcohol on pregnant mothers um, as an undergrad. But then he became, uh, went to medical school and I, maybe I was born in medical school. That was Baltimore. And then his first internships were in Boston at Mass General, um, about three when we moved there. And then it's it's Vietnam is going on. So uh, he ended up getting sent, he was either going over to Germany or I guess Vietnam, and they ended up sending him to uh, Texas, to El Paso in West Texas. So we were stationed there for a few years. Um, and when he got out, I gather they offered them, let him stay in, they were gonna make him a colonel. And he said, no, I don't think so. I'd like to, I'd like to get out of the army now. And uh, so we went to Denver for him to finish his internships, uh, his last year or fellowship, I guess. And then Houston, he originally was doing research work and uh, teaching there either at Rice or University of Houston. Um, but he, he did it for a year and decided he'd rather be practicing. So we, he had some friends from the army who were out in uh, in California. And so he came out to the Bay Area and set up like the first real neonatal, neonatal team out there. Um, and that I'm about 10 at that point. Um, so I mostly stayed there after that. Okay, because we were talking at the beginning about West Coast and East Coast yeah. and your home. And I think like, wow, when you've moved around so much when you're this, when you're caravanning in the way that you were, like, do you like having your own home now? Yeah, very much. It's always been really, really important to me, probably because I didn't have it growing up. Um, uh, that always really matter. For years and years, I had these big houses uh, where I lived with lots of friends before Counting Crows was successful and, and afterwards. Um, you know, I had this house in L.A. that was always full of, you know, four or five stable, steady roommates at a time and then or housemates and then 
up to 20. It was like the defunct de facto hotel for every band coming through town, especially bands from New Orleans, because most of my housemates moved out from there. Um, the little art, art communes and stuff. It's, it's really important to me. I think, you know, for me, I, I don't identify with a lot of those places that I live. They were brief and I felt so displaced. I, I think of myself as being from Texas, from like the Bay Area and from uh, New York, I guess, because I've been here for 18 years now, almost, almost 20 years, 20 years next year. What's the age difference between you and your sister? Nicole's two years younger, a little, un, little less than two years younger. Like So it was really the two of you? Yeah, very much so. We're, we're really close still. Um, she worked for years as a, like a legislative liaison working for nonprofits. Uh, she was, uh, I think, the VP of communication for AARP for a long time. She was very involved as uh, the person who would go on TV and do the messaging when uh, President Obama was setting up the Affordable Care Act. Um, she was on CNN a lot right then. Uh, and now she does like freelance for nonprofits and she runs our foundation. Um, does Counting Crows have a foundation? Yeah. Uh, like, what's sort of the focus of that? It, it's uh, the idea, I guess I feel that people think that contributing to society is either fruitless or something someone else is doing or something where your contribution doesn't make a big difference. So Graybird's main motivation is to kind of introduce people to the idea of being involved. And we, we, we find uh, two to three nonprofits in every uh, city we go through on tour, uh, usually an environmental group, a, uh, a women's shelter or a rape hotline. And uh, God, I can't remember what the third one was. Oh, uh, it's often like a, a an AIDS clinic. Uh -huh. um, and uh, we set up booths with them uh, on the concourse at our gigs. And we talk about them from the stage. Uh, we donate money to them. But we really just try and get people with the involved with the idea of just going up and talking to them. Because I think the biggest thing about involvement is often feeling like your contribution doesn't mean much, which is why we don't really work with national groups at all, but only right. with, with local groups where like it is... The environmental thing is often the river in your town or the playground or, you know, that there are the people, in, you know, in danger, in need of the shelter it could be your sister, your, right. your, your mother, you know, it's a, yeah. it's very local. That, that's it's kind of where it goes. To be micro rather than macro, macro like that is sort of an incredible way in. Yeah. That's great. Um, so you mentioned that uh, you were playing in a lot of bands. Um when you're growing up driving around this country of ours, we're in America right now, if you're listening, not in America, um, are you listening to music all the time in the car? And what are you listening to when you're growing up? In the car, probably. Uh, although what I really remember doing in the car is reading constantly. But where we were really, where I was really listening to music was at home. I was obsessed with, my parents had a lot of records, which. They didn't seem to ever listen to, but they had a ton, a lot of Beatles, um, and they would take us to see music. I remember seeing, I think my first show was the Jackson Five when I was about six or seven at a rodeo in Texas. Um, oh my gosh, that's incredible. Yeah. yeah that was uh, the first record I ever like held in my hand, the ABC record. That oh, was yeah. like, I can picture it. That was a big deal in my youth. That was the first record I ever got as my own record. Like was either right after or right before the concert, I got the I got the Jackson Five Greatest Hits and Michael Jackson's solo album got to be there. Um, I walked into a record shop and bought the records. Yeah, but maybe with my parents. I don't know that I, you know, El Paso is the first town where I remember doing things on my own. Like you know, when you're a kid, you're always with your family, but then at some point you end up in a vacant lot with some kids or by yourself or riding your bike around on your own. And the first place I really remember doing that was El Paso. You know. And what about playing music yourself and singing? Uh, in front of the mirror with a tennis racket. I have very vivid memories of singing Can't Buy Me Love uh, with a tennis racket, but not actually playing it. My first band was when I was in, I was probably 14. Some kids I knew at Temple and we started a band and we played at our friend's bar and bat mitzvahs those years. Uh, I, I, uh, had been listening to Kiss 
Wow, that is a bright. Uh, I've been listening to Kiss. I'm and so I, sad it's a podcast because you're so beautifully lit right now with your sunshine. So yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I, I've been listening to Kiss, the record Destroyer. And I had, for some reason, I don't remember the motivation for this. I had learned the words to Beth. Mm -hmm. At some point, I'd been singing it to myself a lot. And I guess I was, something happened. And I ended up around the back of Hebrew school singing Beth to a bunch of girls. I don't know how I ended up there doing that. I don't remember. Um, and they loved it. <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh, this is different. This is a whole new kind of reaction from girls that I've never gotten before. I should start a band. You know, like we we need to have a band. Yeah. ASAP because- and we're going to call it KISS. <laughs> we're going to touch. This is really good. Um, did you think you were, did you like how you looked when you were little? No, I don't think I ever really did like how I looked until uh, I had dreadlocks, you know, and uh, I very vividly. When, when did that start? When did you I grow your like hair out? I was like eight, maybe. I had, you know, long hair growing up. Um, I'll show you. Uh, always, but I, I didn't, it was... My, the first dreads were extensions at first, and they were all they were throughout as well. But I, I grew my dreads into them as, as well. But that was me when I was like. Wait, uh, hang on, leave it for one second. Okay, wait, is that your hair or is that not your hair? That's me. That's me at okay. like seventeen. So curly um, hair. But I remember like walking down the street in San Francisco, and there's a bunch of art galleries above Union Square, and they have big picture windows because they're art galleries. And I, I looked in one of the windows, and I saw myself with the dreads, and I thought, oh, yeah, that's me. Because my whole life, I'd looked in mirrors and felt like, that doesn't feel like what I'm supposed to look like. I'm not doing this right. I'm not cutting my hair right or something. That doesn't look like, that picture actually looks like how I think I should look, but I didn't know it at the time somehow. But yeah. uh but the dreads, I felt like, oh, yeah, that's me. That feels right. And it was the first time I think in my life I was sort of comfortable in my skin. Um, before that, no, nah, I didn't really like the way I looked. And that's not until you're in your 20s. Yeah, like late 20s. And that hair was so iconic that when you cut your hair, it was in people like that was in people <laughs> and on Twitter, like people were very invested in it. Um, like people get invested in what their rock stars look like. If they're going to be you for Halloween, that's how people know they're Adam Duris for Halloween, right? So that's a big deal. I mean, you can walk around thinking that people are invested in you for these deep, complex reasons about art and emotion. And they are to a certain extent. But, but all really, you really have to do is cut your hair to see like, oh yeah, it's still really about that isn't it yeah that's what you fun. Was just <laughs> you, human, lose, you, know? you lose all your followers like huh it was yeah. right were you ever approached about like being the brand ambassador for the extensions that you used no no i don't no, think i did happen to that i was open about them being that but i didn't talk about it in that way really yeah but i wasn't really like open to things like that I, I, it seems silly to me now actually because Everyone else in the world is out there making money and in all sorts of ways and like yeah. and capitalizing on their fame and starting businesses and doing commercials and being charming doing it. Yeah. But like white people in rock and roll have so much guilt about whether we're like sellouts or not. It seems so stupid to me. If there's one thing everyone in the world should understand. It's that you got to make a living and that you should make a living. And we idolize people who are successful at making a living in so many different ways. But white rock musicians are so guilt ridden about it. And it, it's never made much sense to me. Like I, I Jay Z is a genius. I admire him for 50. I mean, I love his music, but I admire him for 50 different things too. He's not sitting around waiting for the world to get tired of him as they usually do with everybody. He went and made businesses on his own and took care of his family and his friends and whatever, you know, himself uh, diversified. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
So why, when you say you're part of like this very uh, unique group of people that could have a support group for each other, white rock stars who feel guilty about this particular aspect of fame, um, why? Oh, I don't know. You know, I, I don't think I really thought about it that concretely until, uh, I guess it was around 2002, we were getting ready to release Hard Candy. Radio had been really changing. It was very, very genre specific. Instead of just being FM rock radio, which played all kinds of stuff, mm -hmm. it was very much like new metal and alternative and classic rock and adult alternative. You know, it was all these AAA, all these different very narrow labels of what music was supposed to be that only played that. And we didn't really fit in any of it. We had been an alternative band. We'd been a college radio band at one point, but everything was so narrow now and none of it really fit what we did. I didn't think of us as a classic rock band at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was going to be difficult with the new record. We had, I thought we had some great songs on it and uh, Coke came to us and said, Hey, we want to put you I want to pay you to put you on a Coke commercial and play American Girls. And we're going to put this on TV the entire summer when you're on tour leading up to the release of your album in the fall. And your single will be on TV and the radio all the time. All the time. And yeah. I thought, oh, that's better than radio. That's actually really great. You know, I'll do it. Um, and we just got so much flack for it from fellow musicians, from, you know, like the media. It was such a weird thing. I remember th I hadn't really thought of it in those terms until then. I just hadn't really, nothing really interested me about selling my music for something. But, you know, after that, it really pissed me off. The idea that we have to uh, like apply for credibility to make a living, it seems so stupid to me. Nobody else is doing that. That's Nobody. right. That's you know, right. And it's only, this small group of, it's not even about rock stars. It's like, it's this group of like white musicians who are feeling like they're the, I don't know what the, and, and the critics who feel like they have to be the guardians of taste and everything. And uh, that there's something we're all, I don't know what it is we're supposed to be living up to. It seems silly to me, um, but it became very clear to me at that moment that it was, there was a lot of negatives to doing it uh -huh. uh, like that. We got a lot of flack for it. And uh, Did you make really, a lot of money for it? No, no, not at all. I mean, because we didn't get paid much. It was already after, who was it that had that Jaguar commercial? Sting at one point had a Jaguar commercial that completely broke his whole record when no one was playing him on the radio. It was about a year or two before that. So at that point, uh, uh, commercials were going, you know, company corporations were going through this period of like, you should almost pay us to put you in our commercials, I which see. I'm not doing, but they weren't paying much. I, they maybe paid us 10 grand for the use of it that whole summer, which is not right. much, less than we right. would get for use in a movie. But it, it, it was, I think, pretty good uh, exposure. It just came with a backlash too. So you, you're, there's such a, a burden of cool in music in a way, you know, unlike any other art form, uh, we literally wear our, we, we wear music as our personal cool and we literally wear it on our shirts. Yeah. You know, it, it is it is such a defining thing about who we are. I'm a guy who likes teenage fan club. Right. I've got this cool Scottish band on my shirt, you know, like. And so there is a little bit of like, you have to think about things that will expose you. But it's not the same as no publicity is bad publicity, because it definitely comes with negatives. If you're not cool in music, it becomes a lot harder for people to like you because they don't want to talk to their friends about you. They don't want you know what I mean? It's a yeah, yeah. hard thing at times. When you go back to them, um, is that is is someone washing dishes or something in the background at your house or pots or is there some sort of I'm hearing like it's our, our our cleaning lady is here cleaning in the other end of the house. Got so it. Okay. I, I, I just wasn't thinking of that when we decided on Thursday. But that's yeah. okay. It'll just be it'll be part of the, the soundtrack or she can come talk to us. Um, when you go back to I think you said were you 28 when an agent first approached you for the first time about making a record? How old did you say you were? Uh, I was 27 when someone came to see one of my other bands. Uh, and I, I think it was a, about a week later that someone came to see a, a version of Counting Crows kind of, uh, when Counting Crows first formed, we didn't really play any gigs, that version of the band. And then it split up and I was in a couple other bands that were more successful. 
And during that period, uh, Dave Bryson, one of the guys in the band with me still, he and I started playing some open mics uh, and just playing some acoustic gigs because we just liked playing together and we sort of were having fun doing it. I didn't really want to be in that band anymore at that point, um, but we were enjoying playing acoustically and somebody came. We had then put a version, of, another version of Counting Crows together that's kind of this band that you see now, okay. um, an early version of it. Uh, but right after that, somebody came to see us play just as an acoustic duo. And then he brought his cousin who worked for EMI back a week later. And then that guy invited us a week after that to come down to LA to meet with him. And he met with us after hours. It was weird. We met with us at six o'clock. EMI was all dark and completely closed down. We met with this guy in his office. He was like the VP of soundtracks, I think, at EMI. So he didn't really even sign bands. Um, and he presented us with this whole vision he had for, he would sign us, but not to a record deal, to a development deal. So he would give us some money. We would therefore be committed to the label. He would give us a little bit of money to make a video. And he had the video thought up in his head. We were going to do our acoustic version of our song Round Here, which was actually a cover of a song from my other band, Himalayans. Um, and he, the vision was that we would do it on this little acoustic stage we'd played on at the at the Paradise Paradise Hotel. What was it called? I can't remember. It was a, it was a rock club in, in uh, San Francisco. And there would be like, a, it would be pitch black and there would just be a curtain of lasers, like a laser curtain. And as we started the song, the two of us, we would slowly walk forward and you would, you would feel our face passing through the lasers like, like a waterfall, you know? And we would come out and eventually we'd, we'd be fully out and we'd be in black pants, black turtlenecks, black uh, sports coats. And we would sing, it was kind of like Simon and Garfunkel, you know? And we would- moving shots. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, really? it was, it's it was, everything. It was a weird thing because, on the one hand, I have been playing in the clubs for eight years at this point, sure. and I've never had anyone come to see me play. Uh, right. I mean, earlier, like a, about six weeks earlier, someone had come to see one of the other bands, but I was seeing backgrounds in that band, helping out a friend. But, you know, it, the thought of, getting a record contract is something that lives in a distant land it's it's not even reachable from where i was and here's a guy talking about something that leads to a record contract even though it's sort of shitty because by signing the development deal you lose all your leverage all your ability to go anywhere else and he's going to make a video and then take it to the company and it sounds like the absolute wrong thing you know a it's the band that i'm least interested in because we're just playing as an acoustic duo i don't really want to be an acoustic duo right uh, and the video itself sounds all wrong but i've never had any interest from a record company like yeah. that. And so it's some, it's like uh, here i am you know it's been eight years in the clubs at this point or more you know 10 years i guess oh yeah 10 years at that point almost and you know it's a real I didn't know what to do and we ended up it's kind of what led to us getting a record contact eventually because it made us realize that we were a little out of our depths and we needed to find a lawyer and we eventually found one friends of friends of friends of friends fathers fathers friends it was so many levels later and such a dumb bit of luck to stumble into this guy who was a very successful lawyer okay. who, who wanted to work with us and also pointed us to a couple managers who we met with who had nothing but successful acts um and so from there having met them we were able to like go to other record companies later you know with with the real band but that first experience was so kind of like everything you've ever wanted and nothing you would ever want in one kind of all wrapped up which is by the way exactly how the record business works for most people anyways um we, I guess we could have jumped on that and maybe it would have been okay. Maybe it would have been horrible. I don't know. I think it would have been horrible. But Were you scared when you said no? Were you up going, what did I just do? Or were you like, you know what? I'm young. My gut tells me this isn't it, but maybe something's going to happen. I, I think I just felt like it was all wrong and I was terrifying, uh, you know, and uh, it was more like, yeah, we, I told him we had to think about it. And then by the time we got the lawyer, about a month later, the lawyer said, no, no, no. Okay. We're not doing this. Um, How long after that are you on Saturday Night Live? 
uh, I don't know, a year or two. Saturday Night Live. Is, really soon, though. Like, well, we if got, you think about it. We found our managers a few months later. Like, that was August of 91, I think. And we found our managers uh, a few months later, like, in the fall of 91. And then we put this demo together that went out to we already had a demo uh, but we put they they took it out to record companies being successful managers they could actually go to everybody and then between, do you remember what songs were on the demo the original one well <laughs> the funny thing it was it was a 15 song demo originally which is you know you put one song on a demo maybe three so you uh, made a record and called it a demo yeah. We had a 15 song demo, which it had this interesting effect on people, though, because uh, on the one hand, we look like total rubes sending out a 15 song demo. On the other hand, the demo included Round Here, Rain King, uh, Anna Begins, Omaha, Mr. Jones. Uh, that's probably the five from that first out. Murder of One, maybe. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and 10 other songs that were pretty good, you know, the, and so like. On the one hand, it was way too long. On the other hand, it, it when people like, after laughing at us, listened to a few songs, they started flipping out. And the more songs they heard, the more it would became, it's one of the reasons we had a huge bidding war was that too, because it, it, there's nothing that is more bankable than songs. You know, everybody, a, a band might be great for one record, but songs are something you can just do. And so that looks like gold to a record company. and. And, you it know, was, and it is. So that was like, we got signed. I mean, every rec company in the country came to one of two gigs in, I think, January or February of 92. And we, and then we got offers from every company. We got signed by about May of that year and started making the record in fall of 92. So that's about a year after that first thing happened with that guy. And then it came out in the fall of 93. And so uh, Saturday Night Live is January 10th, 94, maybe something like that. Do you remember that? Oh, Did yeah. you, first of all, I grew up, I mean, Saturday night, that was appointment television, right? Like watching Saturday Night Live. Was that a part of your childhood or teendom or 20s? Did you have a connection to that show? Certainly when I was young, like in yeah. the, when I was a kid in, in the 70s, because the original show was so good. Yeah. Uh, and there were casts after that that were too, but, um, and it was pretty good still when we were on there, but uh, the writing had, you know, like I, it's an off and on thing now. There's some really funny stuff. I haven't watched it. I haven't really watched it since then. Right. Uh, it was well, you've been busy. Experience. You've it been was very busy. Experience. Yeah. Um, but, but was being on it, was that heady or were you in such a flow at that point that it was all happening in a way? Like, are you even conscious of what's happening at that time? Oh yeah. I mean, that's our first, appearance on television um and it made our career it absolutely made our, our record you know mr jones had been out the video came out between christmas and new years of 93 but the record wasn't even in the top 200 um we played saturday night live a couple weeks later like second week of january uh and the record literally like i'm not exaggerating jumped 40 plus spots every week for five it was like 213 when we played the next week it was 170 something then 130 something 90 something 50 something 16 14 for like three weeks eight four two for the next year and a half it was at number two um and and, it, and that band like that that group of brothers who are in your band at that time are you all together all the time going through this or is everyone sort of like like what's that this family is now having oh yeah we you said earlier like you're like this happens to nobody except it just happened to you guys yeah i mean we were on tour so we were literally sharing hotel rooms together okay so it corresponded with your touring and is that just in the u.s at the time or are you touring outside of the country too? no i mean the record came out in october maybe of 93 and we immediately went on the road we did a few shows with uh, Midnight Oil, and then we went on tour all across the country, opening for Suede, uh, and the Cranberries were the middle band, and the Cranberries wow. blew up during that tour. Um, and then 
that finished up like in the late fall and we did a, a leg with cracker and then we were went home for like new year's and christmas and then we went back out for a couple weeks by ourselves at the beginning of january which when we played saturday night live and then we were going back on the road with cracker again um for a few more months so we were just playing our very first shows on our own outside of the of home those weeks at the beginning in january january and a little bit of february of that year we played about 10 gigs on our own and then we went back up with cracker for a few more months and then we played letterman i think in like march and from there we headed to uh europe for the month of april for our first european tour um april of 94 yeah you are like such an extraordinary prolific songwriter and i mean just thinking of the songs you named that were on that demo like that's how you started um that's where you started right that's not like and then like 15 years later i sort of hit my stride and figured out how to write a couple of hit songs like you wrote hit after hit after hit like songs that were you know anthems for people songs that you go and you play and everyone's singing them back at you right like that's you now that is you and your band when when do you realize this is us now all those bands i used to go see all those rock stars i thought i would never be all those other jobs i had to do so i could play gigs in these other like when do you are you conscious like this is actually happening this is us well i think playing saturday night live and letterman were pretty cool and big deals even though being right in the middle of them you don't experience them as like rock stardom and like i said we were an opening band we weren't uh there was no visible sign that we'd become any kind of big deal mm -hmm. uh, you know after saturday night live between saturday night live and uh letterman watching the charts we could see the record leaping up the charts you know and then we went to europe and you know, it, it felt like a weird Beatlesque reverse Beatles, like the Beatles going to play Ed Sullivan, you know, like being in another country and having people interested in your music, that seemed like a really big deal, but still we're not big over there. It wasn't until, and the weird thing, while we were over there, Kurt uh, died, who I knew, Cobain, died while we were in Europe, um, which was, and we also did the interviews and the photo sessions for the cover of Rolling Stone over there, um, which was, kind of freaky um, and all these things are signs that you're famous but there's still no visible you know, tangible evidence but when we came back from europe we flew back into new orleans it was jazz fest and we were playing to patinas in a couple days and i'd been going down to new orleans for a while on my own anyways uh it was my favorite place and i'd been going to jazz fest with friends before i was famous you know and the first day we were there, we went out to the fairgrounds and I, I got mobbed. And that hadn't happened. That was because we'd been out, all that stuff that was happening that was making us famous that we were seeing on the charts, it, it gathered itself into something while we were overseas in Europe. And by the time we got back, I think the Rolling Stone came out like a week later or had already come out. And so that means your face is on every street corner. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard for, to describe it to people now, but newsstands were everywhere then. Yeah. And when you were on the cover of a magazine like Time or Newsweek or Rolling Stone, you were everywhere. And uh, it, it all, I didn't realize it, the tangible evidence wasn't there until we got back from Europe. But when right away, I mean, I was at the, the festival in Jazz Fest and I got mobbed. And I to us in Dumaine, Dumaine across the street. I'm not sure. I can't remember, but Governor Nichols, I don't know what it is, but it, it was thousands of people outside. We actually, after the show, Dave Bryson and I walked outside and played to the crowd for a song. Um, so, you know, the, those were the first things I noticed of like, oh, we're famous. This is actually uncomfortable. This is kind of scary. You know, like uh -huh. it, I, I was a very shy person and not really used to any of this stuff. And you know, not comfortable around people very much, 
probably had something to do with my childhood, never really knowing anybody. Um, yeah, yeah. But all of a sudden, everybody things. knew me. Yeah. And uh, it, it kind of freaked me out then. Do you feel like you started behaving differently? How did you hold no. on to yourself? No, I, I, I was still me, everyone else. I've yeah. often said that fame is not something you do, it's something other people do to you. Uh -huh. you, know, you may do the thing that makes you famous, but the fame thing, it all takes part, takes place outside of you. That's, that's, it's a reaction that people have to something that is like omnipresent. You know, we're not used to seeing things that are everywhere. Like, it's like the, when you walk up to the Eiffel Tower after seeing a million pictures of it, it's a real thing. And you're yeah. kind of, wow, when you see a person on a magazine or on TV and then you see them in person, it's a real thing. It's like walking up to the Eiffel Tower and yeah. people are weird about it. Yeah. yeah. But I don't think I changed at all. I, I I think people do, but I don't really think I have. I mean, I'm sure I've changed because it's been 30 years and I've grown up a lot. But sure, um, you know, it was more other people as far as I could tell. I just felt like everyone started acting crazy. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a little bit about your process? Because I mean, it you could have been a poet you could have written fiction I mean your writing sort of lends itself to so many different genres you happen to find your sweet spot because you also love music and and write music and can compose what a fabulous thing for the planet that you found both those things um can you just talk a little bit about how you write what you need to write do you set yourself up and and like lock yourself away because you have to write or does it just happen? I'm sure over 30 years, it's, it's, it's been many different variations on a theme, but can you talk a little about that? The main thing I need to write is music. Um, it's why I couldn't have been a poet or, uh, or written prose or anything else really, except for songs, because I don't think that way. I don't- It starts uh, with the music, not the words. Always okay. music first or at the same time, but never very, 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 rarely if ever is it words first I'm, I'm trying to think of a song where it was and i i can't even think of one so I, let's take this is an old one and then obviously your new album is an unbelievable it it, it has chapters it's incredible um let's just take sullivan street just as a random song of your of your collection of of classics um talk about sullivan street how did how does that get written that's actually a you weird. Remember one. it? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I tell you exactly how that one gets written because it's so weird. It's so different that it, it's very memorable to me. Oh, okay. I don't really. I can't really play guitar. Uh, I play piano and not very well. Um, but uh, I was sitting around with Dave Bryson one day, and I had his guitar in my lap, and I, I, I guess I knew how to make a couple chords, and I think I was playing a D chord, and then I lifted one of my fingers up, and that makes a different chord. And then I put the finger back down and it goes back to the D and then I lifted it and goes back to another chord. And I was like, Oh, wow. Take the way home leads back. So now that's really cool. Dr. Water home through the town. I sang like a verse, maybe not the right lyrics, but I sang the verse and I was like, uh, I'm almost. And I'd like, I, I can't get this. I gave the guitar to Dave. I'm like, I'm almost drowning in his seat. I hummed it to him, whatever it was. And he's like, Oh yeah. Uh, come on, come on. Yeah. It's this. I go, okay. Okay, now give it back. To Dick. You're, actually, you just play it. Here's those two chords I was playing. Uh, it, that was an accident because I just started playing literally what it's some chord and then another version, another chord that's just one finger lifted off that first chord. It changes the chord. I don't know what it is even, um, but I was just doing it and it played these two chords and I just started singing. And then I panicked at the chorus and handed it to him because it was too complicated. I had the melody in my head, but I didn't have the ability to play it, whatever it was. And so I panicked and threw the guitar to him and said, here, take this, take this, take this. I got it in my head. Listen to me. I'm going to sing it. And that, then we wrote that song. It was, I think he, I can't remember if there's a bridge on that one or not. Um, so we wrote that together really, but it just came from me messing around on the guitar. Again, it's just a piece of music that I'm playing accidentally because I can't play anything by ear, not piano, not guitar, but I will like, I sit at the piano and I'll fuck around with my hands until they make certain, I know how to make chords, uh -huh. how to make them and make them more interesting and 
play them weirdly, but I, I can't play by ear at all. So I'll mess around with things until I find something that I like, or I'll have a tune running around in my, the last couple of days I've had this tune running around in my head and I sat down yesterday and figured out what it was, how to play it. It was very difficult because I can't, I'm so rudimentary that I have to like scratch everything out kind of, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's like figuring out calculus when you don't know how to do math, but you, you use it somehow you manage to make addition and subtraction, do it. Um, it's like that uh, for me on piano, I can barely play to this day, but I've written all this stuff because I, 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 I will play until I get it. Um, That's sometimes crazy. It's stuff, you know, sometimes it's stuff with me thinking stuff in my head and sometimes it's me just, a lot of times it was just me sitting down at the piano and playing a lot and until something made me want to sing to it. And then I would sing to it. Um, you sing about places a lot. Or, or certainly name places a lot in your songs. Um, I guess I just want to say, because you don't usually get to talk to the people who you listen to. I just love that. That's all I want to say about that. I love, I love specificity. Not always, but there's something about you letting me know where you are. And it doesn't matter if I've been to that place or not. I love, I, I don't know. I just love that. I don't know if that's, something you love or it just happens to be that oh, way it's a big part of writing you know to me i think details are incredibly important in writing um i, I remember i'm trying to remember if it was like a movable feast some hemingway where he's talking about writing and i think he talks about like it's not so important to tell people how you feel because that can be very vague but tell them what's on the walls in the room you're in. I, I may be paraphrasing it. I paraphrased right. it so many times since then that I'm sure I'm using my own version. But the idea is if you tell people what's on the walls in the room you're in, your how you're feeling will come through. Because if you just say, I really loved her, it doesn't really mean anything that hits us emotionally. You've heard those words used so many times. They stand for a much deeper, more textured group of feelings that are really important. But just summing it up as I really loved her, that's not going to break anybody's heart. It's not going to move anybody. Um, unless you're, it's a point of like extreme earnestness at a moment where you're, you've not, but you've been restrained the whole time and suddenly you're saying something really, you know, it's more important to talk about like all at once I look across a crowded room to see the way that light attaches to a girl, you know, like from long December. Now that it's a, it's a painting, the specificity of what it felt like, which is like, I was starting to really care for her, but this is specifically what I noticed at that moment, which was light attaching to her across a room and how much she became the only person that thing I was looking at. That tells you more about feelings than yeah. I started to have a crush on, on this other girl. Yeah. That, doesn't, that doesn't really communicate much. And I think details do that, whether you also because uh, someone else's art can be very, very disembodied um, if you don't give it body by Tell them the room you're in, tell them the place you're in, tell them the road you're on, the city you're going to, anything to give it a place and time so it's not this vague group of disembodied feelings flashing across uh, a radio. You know, like details, I, that's why I write that way. I feel like details are really, really important. Um, it doesn't have to be like a city or a person's name, those, those work really well. Um, it can be just like words that are fun to say, you know, exactly. like uh, I was writing a thing today and the lyric was, gimme, gimme good dreams. Gimme, gimme, gimme good dreams. Give me Benetton and Benzedrine. Gimme shimmy, shimmy cocoa cream. You know, like I was just, it was, there were words that were fun to say together about, it was, you know, it's part of a chorus about the 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 sex in music you know and like how it's like the sex in rock and roll like how present it is the sexuality of it and like i don't know and just sometimes just putting together words that were fun to say like the gimmies in that are really there's something like textural about them that that, that brings a moment to life you know um there's a lot of different ways to do it, you know. It's funny that you mentioned that song because 
you were just on Seth Meyers recently because Letterman was a guest and he had been so um, influential in many of us getting to see you for the first time because when Letterman met your band, it thrilled him and he had you guys on a yeah. lot. Um, and there was something so sweet. You know, Letterman, you don't see him as a very vulnerable guy, although he certainly showed other parts of himself more recently since he's left the Letterman show. Um, and you were like a surprise for him. And you sat down at that piano and you played, you played uh, Long, Long December, just you and a piano. It was so simple and pure and beautiful. Um, what was that whole event like for you? Um, it was cool. I mean, I, the late night came on a few months before I went to college, like, and it was a huge part of the end of high school for me. Uh, cause I think it came on the air in 1980, either, I think early 82, Yeah, like February of 82, something like that. And I went to college in August of 82, you know? And, uh, so I was like really turned on by the weird ass shit he was doing back then you know uh chris elliott on the man under the seats you know that larry bud melman it was so insane and weird and brilliant comedy uh, and paul schaefer in the band yeah. and their their rapport all of that yeah nothing i'd ever seen like like what he it was like now i can look back on and say what it was was this really meta uh commentary on television and television talk shows specifically but at the time, it just seemed so insane and brilliant. When I went to college, we watched it every night. And I was such a huge fan. So by the time we got to play it, I mean, I that was a bigger deal. Saturday Night Live made our career. It, it really did. Sure, sure. But Letterman was a bigger deal for me personally um, because I was so in awe of him uh, and and so like, flipped out by I idolized him you know and so to go on there and also when we first played he came on after we played and he goes do you not have this record what's wrong with you this is the last record anyone needs he said something like this is all you need uh and it was just so he was so effusive in his love for the band uh, and you know he's not a very open personable person off camera so I was but he did come up to me I was in the audience watching them work before we played and I held this hand on my shoulder and it, it was a letterman. And he said, I, I'm just really, I'm really glad you're here. And I'm really excited that you come to play. And then he walked off and I wanted to say something, but he was gone. Yeah. And then I was sort of sitting there like, damn, I was pissed at myself. And this one of the crew walked over and goes, what did he say? And I told him, he goes, wow, I, I've never ever seen him do that with anyone. And I was like, oh, you know and then when he said when we when we finished playing what he said you know he's a very internal person i think but he was so effusive and it, uh you know it was amazing and yeah he was so great about that and and so uh, for, to go there and play it reminded me of a million things of being in college of of i went actually that week and on youtube and watched all these segments from those that first year or two mostly from the first year just how groundbreaking and like there's a lot of things like that now television has been completely changed by him but there was none of that then you know like you couldn't that kind of attitude uh you know it, it you know and also i really like seth he's one of the nicest guys and it's always a pleasure being on his show he's such a you know a music fan and he's just you know television can be a hassle for musicians because like the movies can, you are the last thing that matters and you feel it, you know, but he's always so nice. So I was like really honored to be asked um, and a little nervous. Um, we've all been inside on our own for so much the last couple of years. It was weird to think about going on stage and playing on TV by myself. Um, like I said, I'm not very good at piano. Um, and so it, it's hard, not, not that song. It's not hard to play, but I don't have a lot of confidence about it. Um, and then it was perfect at soundcheck. It was perfect at the camera blocking. And then in the show itself, when I sat down to play, I realized they asked me, can you hear the piano in your ears? I tapped it. Yeah. Your voice. Yep. Check, check. Okay. It's fine. We came back from commercial, went to play. I'm three chords in and I realized 
oh shit, the sustain pedal's gone. It's not plugged in or it's broken, but it's not there anymore. I got to play this without a sustain pedal. <laughs> and when you're a shitty piano player, you live on the sustain pedal. It covers all mistakes by keeping the sound steady yeah. and it just gives a cushion for everything. And when you're not good, it's really hard to play without a sustain pedal. And I was like, should I stop? Now nah, I'll just play it through and then I'll tell them afterwards if they want to fix it, they can, you know. But, so I played it through, but it was a little hairy. Have but, you watched? No, nah, I didn't want to watch it. So when you did you say to them afterwards, like, hey, do you need me to do that again? Or did you not even do that? Yeah, I went to my monitor guy and the producer, like one of the guys that was backstage, and I said, hey, there's a problem. I don't know if you want to check it out but the sustain pedal broke and it wasn't working through the song and it, it definitely made it harder for me. I mean, I think I'm okay. I was okay, but, yeah. uh, and I sang really well, but that you should listen to it because it might be something you want to fix. And I'm happy to play it again if you want me to, or leave it. Yeah. They went downstairs and checked it out and they came back. Yeah, it's audible. We can hear it. Um, but it sounds really good. Do you want to play it again? And I said, yeah, I guess I would rather just do it again. I can do it better. You know? And then they went back out there and they'd already broken it down. So it was all gone. And I was like, okay you know i left it so and did you have an exchange with david and seth or were did you play at a different time oh, I, I was they were there i i uh we stood up there for a while like well the camera's taking pictures of us we took a picture together and i talked to Dave. i mean i, I talked to seth before the show for a little <laughs> while he was really <laughs> nervous too he's like I can't wait till we get to your part of the show because it will mean that I got through the rest of the show without screwing up. Yes. You know, everyone's got it's through. a big night for everybody. It is, yeah. it was, you know, and uh but uh I, I only saw him very briefly afterwards. I didn't say anything about it because I I mean I was fine, I thought it'd be okay. Um and I did get to talk to Letterman a little bit backstage before we left, just a little. I think he's a very nervous person and I'm very shy around my idols. I have real problems talking to idols like that. And uh, you should see me go mute around Springsteen. It's embarrassing. It is the worst. It is the worst. I've known him for longer than I've had a career. And he's always been really nice to me from back when I was nobody. And he's the nicest guy in the world. And I can't talk to him. It's embarrassing. But That's hilarious. Okay, well, first of all, I just want to tell you, um, if you ever do want to watch yourself on Seth Meyers, I think it was just two weeks ago. I think it's one of the most beautiful performances you've ever done. Like, I just want you oh to know there's something so vulnerable and open and quiet and you're in great voice, by the way, um, which- I felt like I sang really well. I felt like I really sang. Did, you really did. I don't know if you like really took time to warm up or if you were just in that like sweet spot with it, but I think you're gonna be as happy as it, as you think as as well as you think think you sang you did like there's you're not gonna go like oh i thought i sounded better than that it's really beautiful um and and okay. also the moment where seth tells mr letterman that you're about to play it there's something that happens to letterman's face that is breathtaking that's all i want to say the whole thing is so beautiful um and I'm just, I feel so lucky that I got to see it. I want to switch gears for a minute because I told you before we started recording that um, I told Patty Lapone that I was going to have you on today. And she's like, he's the coolest doll. And I'm like, I know. Oh. Um, and so I would love to know, because the last time I saw you, we were both gobsmacked sitting, whatever row we were in opening night, masked on, but it didn't matter. We all knew our mouths were hanging open behind our masks in such joyous, gleeful adoration of Patty and everybody in that show. Um, and you said, yeah, like I know Patty. And I was like, Adam Duritz knows Patty Lapone. Okay. I didn't want to know then because I wanted to save it for this podcast. How do Adam and Patty know each other? Well, I, I, I love the theater. I have my whole life. Uh, it's a big draw for why I live in New York, the chance to be able to go to it all the time. And for years, I went to every opening. I mean, everything. I saw every single play that opened off and on. I went to everything. I was just, uh, it's been less in the last 10 years, but the first 10 years I lived here, I saw, I don't know how many plays, 20, 30 plays a year. Um, and uh, I went to see 12 Angry Men on Broadway. And I don't remember when that was, but 
afterwards, the party was at Sardi's. I'd never been to Sardi's. And so that was really cool. It's this like, Oh, you know, all the caricatures. It's iconic. Yeah. yeah. Legendary Broadway place. And it was really cool. And I was standing there talking to, uh, wait, I'm, I'm hanging on. I, I want to get his name. So I don't do this wrong. Um, okay. I'll tell you his name. Two seconds. Uh, Okay. Okay. I was at Sardi's for the party afterwards, and I was talking with Henry Simmons, who used to be on uh, NYPD Blue, because Gordon Clapp was in the play. Yes. And so we were, uh, we met there. I met Henry Simmons standing there. I don't know how we ended up talking to each other, but a uh, really nice guy. And we were standing at the party, and he goes, Oh man, look over there. I go, he goes, It's Patty Lapone. I said, oh, wow, so cool. I mean, she's, you know, history on Broadway, you know, and she turns around and she looks at someone and she's like, I mean, it's a party full of people. I, I know I right. do. She's, so she's, she's waving at someone you think behind you. Yeah. And I keep yeah. looking at him. Do you know her? And he goes, no, no, I've never met her. And she's like, she goes, and then she came rushing over and she goes, doll, I'm Patty. I, I love you. And, and uh, it was me. I, I, I was stunned. And she just came over and started talking to me and Henry. And uh, she was amazing. Like she is, you know, and it's just a fantastic person. And I mean, I was so knocked out by talking to her. Um, and I, we exchanged phone numbers that night and we've stayed in touch ever since, you know, like I've gone to see, you know, God, every place she's been in mm -hmm. a number of times. Yeah. Uh, and uh, like, she comes to gigs, but she was in company in London when we played over there and she came to, she brought half the cast <laughs> to see uh, the show. Uh, we played, did we play Wembley or the O2? I can't remember. She came uh, to, to the gig and came hung out backstage with everybody. And she was just, so cool. Have you ever sung together? Even like oh, joking no. around? No, 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 never. Um, no, you know, I, I, I've never been the guy who sings at parties or anything. Well, not that I've been to a lot of parties with Patty. I tend to see her places, but I mean, I'm not, we don't see each other all the time, but I, I just adore her. Um, when you say you love theater, First of all, in all of the albums that your parents had, you, you mentioned Beatles when you were growing up. Did they have like Broadway cast recordings? Are you listening yeah. to show tunes growing up? Some, I mean, they had like Oklahoma with, uh, what's his name? Uh, is it Gordon something or John, John, not John Raid. It was, uh, I can't remember, but uh, they had like, you know, My Fair Lady, like Oscars and Hammerstein stuff. They had Hair to, for sure. Um, I remember them having My Fair Lady. Uh, but we would also go, you know, in San Francisco, they had a Best of Broadway series. So we could see like Beatlemania and Annie. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I would always watch the Tonys, you know, and then you'd have to wait a year for the play to come. And it would be <laughs> exactly, like- Exactly, for the tour. I was so hungry for it as a kid. Um, I think the first show I, I don't know, I was going to say Barnum was the first show I maybe saw on Broadway with Jim Dale and uh, Glenn Close. Uh, but I'm not sure that is. I, I know that when I went to boarding school for one year, I came down to New York a couple times by myself and saw Barnum and I saw the Pirates of Penzance with uh, Kevin Klein and Linda Ronstadt and Rex Smith. Um, I, I mean, maybe my parents took me to something else on Broadway when I was a kid that I'm not remembering on a trip to New York, probably, but I just How was do you really- you love musicals? Like, what is it about musicals that you love? Well, I just love the writing and the, the uh -huh. you know, it was like, Maybe I would have been something I would have liked to have done if, if it was a different time. Like it's not where the culture is now. And I ended up being a writer anyways, not just a, you know, when I was a kid, I wanted to sing and perform, but the only things there were musicals. So it, you know, I didn't write songs until I was 18. So there's all this stuff inside me that really wants to come out. And like musicals seem like a way to express it kind of, but they're not really right. The songs aren't really right for what I want to say. I know it's wrong. And I also know that by the time I'm growing up, it's not really where the culture is anymore. Um, and so I was always kind of mystified by that. Like, 
I feel like I got all this stuff inside me I want to express, but I don't have any idea how to express it. Um, I love music, but I don't write songs. So how am I going to perform music? You know, well, musicals were one way. Certainly, it's not just musicals. I love straight theater too. I yeah, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I was just kind of always confused by that. But I loved going to see it, like addictively. Like I, you know, I love film too. But given a chance to like go on a trip to London with my parents, I'll see eight shows in a week if I can. It's all that it's all that you can fit in, you know. But I'll yeah. go to any of them. Um, and uh, you know, when I got to college, my fall term, my freshman year, I was in a, a class, I feel like it was chemistry. Um, and I, my sister was at home. She was 16. It's a tough time to be a girl, you know, just going through a lot. And I was off at college. And I just started humming this song called Good Morning Little Sister to myself. And I, I had written like, songs in my head before and written some lyrics, but they didn't really mean anything. But I hummed a song, I had a verse and a chorus kind of, and I wrote it all down. And then after class, I rushed back to my dorm. There were, there was a, a lounge across the hall from my dorm room with a piano in it. I went in there and I locked the door and I sat down at the piano and I started like humming the song and poking out notes. All I knew was how to make a major and a minor chord. So I figured if I could find a note, there's only, there's only three notes in a chord. So one of those three notes is probably the right chord for the thing I want to sing right there. You know, so I sat there, it took me all afternoon, it would take me a half an hour now, but I could barely play then. And I, you know, figured out all the chords and that's a different thing than just writing lyrics and singing them to yourself. Writing lyrics and playing it on piano while you sing it, that's a song, you know, and that, so that song was for Nicole, is that your sister's name? So that was for her. Like you had well, this, this thing you were saying to her, right? No, no, no? not really. It was okay. about her. About her. About, well, it was about how, like all of them, they're all about me, really. They're about how I feel about something. And this was how I felt about my sister trying, you know, trying to grow up. And, but I really, I realized, I think that's what I realized at that moment is that none of this stuff is about anybody else. It's all about uh -huh. me. Uh -huh. it's about how I feel about something. And that was a light switch. That moment changed my life. And, and, and I felt it right away, like, like a lightning bolt that hit me because the hardest part about being a kid is how undefined you are. There's only a couple of things that are interesting. I mean, you kind of got to do homework and you want to meet girls or be popular or something. You know what I mean? You want to have friends of one kind or another and let's call romance that too. And you want to, and you got to do homework because they tell you, you know, that's kind of it, you know? And when you start getting closer to when you're supposed to become an adult, 16, 15, 17, whatever it is, you know, and you don't know how you're going to be, my father goes to work every day and saves babies lives, but he's driven to do that. I didn't feel that. So what am I going to do? Like what he does? I get it. I get it for him, but what is there for me? You know, you're so gray as a, as a human being. And, and I got to college and I studied things. There were more girls and I wasn't previously defined by however I'd been in high school. So it was a fresh start. That was all really cool. And there's still homework clearly, but I didn't really have any picture of who I was just trying to make friends and be popular kind of, you know, and, mm -hmm. but then I wrote a song and all that lack of definition was gone. I mean, I was a songwriter. I knew it right then. And I was going to, that's what I was. And that's the rest of my life figured out. I felt so far behind everybody else before that. And all of a sudden I was way ahead. Like I knew what I was doing for the rest of my life. I w was a songwriter. So I would therefore write songs, but I, that's what I was. That's what I did. That's where all this feeling wanted to go. That's why I'd been wanting to sing or perform or be in a musical, but it didn't seem right because it was these songs. And I wrote every day. I mean, every day. I'm not a prolific songwriter at all anymore, but I was then. I wrote every day, song after song after song after song. And I just had been waiting for something to, you know, to give voice to this. And it just poured out of me for a while. Uh, and uh, it was weird because, like, I was way ahead of all my friends. They had no idea what they were doing with their lives. And then we got through college. 
they got jobs. Right. You know, <laughs> I'm writing songs. Um, they're moving up and whatever they're doing, commercial real estate or banking or I don't know, whatever they're, they're retail. I, I don't care. And I'm like, okay, uh, I got a job uh, washing dishes and I had a job landscaping. I did some construction. Uh, I worked in a video store for a little while. got fired from that. Uh, you know, a lot of the jobs that were good jobs, but not really what I wanted to do. Interesting. And they gave me a lot of freedom, which is good. Uh, and then I felt really far behind everybody else because they were getting on with their lives and I was not yeah. going anywhere, it seemed like. Uh, although I was, I didn't know it, but I was getting better at writing. I was learning to work in bands and play music um, because it's hard to play with other people to collaborate. Mm -hmm. You don't know how to do that when you're just sitting in a room, a lounge writing songs. You have to learn to work with four or five other people at once and all the sensitivities. There, I was actually developing, but I didn't think I was. I thought I was just like, treading water and going nowhere and you know people were coming to some shows but I didn't know what it was going to add up to um why do you think why do you think you know in in my world of acting it's like the front man is called sort of number one on the call sheet right like who who is the sort of most successful actor in the thing and sort of how they come on to set or onto the stage so permeates the vibe of what the work culture is going to be. And it can either be incredible or really a drag based on who number one on the call sheet is. Um, it seems to me that you have this really, and I know any band, any group of people, it doesn't matter what their vocation is, it's hard to be together all the time tour bus, I mean, your, your career specifically, you're so on top of each other. There's very little definition between work and not work because it's all one thing. Um, what do you think makes you so naturally a leader or someone who can keep for the most part their band together? Well, I don't think it was something I took too naturally. I, I think I've been very good at it at times in my life and very bad at it at times. Like that first band, that I was in, you know, not the one in, at Hebrew school, but like the first one as an adult was- a, You mean a, kiss, a, not kiss. Not kiss, no. <laughs> I was like 22 to 25 in my first band, really learning to work with other musicians and work with yeah. other people and writing most of the material. Um, it was really hard and really frustrating. And I, it, I, I, a lot of it has to do with being willing to get into arguments with people who are your friends and you kind of lose the friendship part of it in, in being the guy in charge. And it was such a difficult experience that when I quit that band, I decided to stop playing music. And I just, I went, I earned a bunch of money landscaping and uh, saved up to go on a trip to Europe where I could like backpack around Europe and try and forget uh, about playing music. Hmm. And I didn't really work. <laughs> I mean, I tried when I was over there. I, while I was over there, Immer, our guitar player, he joined Camper Van Beethoven, the indie band, and they went on tour with 10,000 Maniacs and I'm getting postcards from him that they're playing the Greek theater at Berkeley. And I was like, oh, fuck, I gotta go home. This isn't working for me. Uh, you know, and I started Counting Crows soon after that, but that broke up kind of for the same reason. I just didn't like being in charge. And my band, the Himalayans, which is what round here is a Himalayan song. Uh, I just joined to sing. I didn't write any music in that band. I, I just, I wrote all the lyrics and I sang and we were a complete democracy and it was a complete pleasure. It was so much fun. And for a year, I just did this weird, wild, psychedelic, like indie rock band and loved it. Uh, and then Dave and I started playing those acoustic shows together and we put together kind of a version of Counting Crows and then another one that actually became this band but only because I realized, okay, I think I am ready to try it again. But I was in three bands right then. One where I was just singing backgrounds and sort of humor Himalayans where, which was the biggest of the bands for sure. The most popular uh, where we were very democratic, just doing it all together. And then I started a version of counting crows because I thought I have some songs I'm writing on my own that aren't really right for Himalayans. And I think I am ready to sort of do this thing. And that band got, discovered and we were getting bigger by then we were probably close to as big as uh himalayans if not about the same size um and it turned out i by the time we like all these people came and wanted to sign us i'd kind of decided that i was ready to 
I had a vision for something I wanted to do musically and I was ready to do it again. And so I had to quit Himalayans because this was going to take up my time and, you know, went back to Counting Crows and, you know, this, this band since then. But even then, like when we first made our first record, I, di I didn't know how to lead a band. It was right after that. And I was terrible at it. I had these ideas that I think were very good ideas for what we should sound like and what we could be like, because we kind of sounded like late model Roxy music then. And I didn't think that was the right thing for us. I just wanted to strip it back. I didn't think we should be a stripped back band, but I wanted us to learn to play together. And in order to do that, I felt like we had to strip everything away and be very simple, which is what the first album is. Um, but that first album was murder to make because I was really, I had a gut feeling for emotionally what I wanted us to be like, but no idea how to like be in charge of people and make us do it. And it was murder on everybody in the band quit at some point during that first album. Um, but we made it through and it was successful. And, you know, I got better at it after that. But I think the real thing that has made a difference is that I realized right then at the beginning that I wanted, I didn't want to be a solo artist. I wanted to be in a band and I wanted to be in this band. And, and I, I had this sort of realization that if this is where you want to be, then this has to be your priority. More important than anything, more important than like things I want are what's good for the whole band. Um, that's a mistake people make because, man, it is really easy to find a very significant and sensible reason why I deserve more. I need more. I should get more. It's only fair if I have more. But if there's not enough for everybody else and you don't watch out for everybody else, then your thing will fall apart. And if it falls apart, you've got more of nothing unless you want to be on your own. And I didn't, you know, and I, I think I realized right at the beginning that I had to make this whole thing the priority and these guys, the priority and always think of them, you know, so we split record money evenly, you know, uh, we split touring money evenly, uh, even for publishing, which is often just words and music. I do a third to words, a third to music, and a third to everyone who played on it in the band so that they are part of everything there too. Um, just to make their needs the thing, all of us, because it, you got to make it so it works for everybody. And different people have different situations. You know, like I am in a relationship for a long time now, but I don't have kids, you know? So that's a... Some of the guys have two, some of them have four kids. That's a different kind of expenses, you know? And like a perfect example is I, you know, I'm always trying to think, I, I feel in a lot of ways my job is to figure out how to make money for seven people <laughs> because it's not about like, that's my main job because if I can't get that to work, then we have no band, you know? And so it's always a challenge to find stuff like that. Um, right, right. Like me and Steve writing a play together, which is something I was so passionate about and well, still am. I, I love, because I love theater so much. I love the work we were doing to making a play. But it took so much time out of the band and it would if we really got serious about it i would have years of out of town tryouts as a writer right. you have to be there for all this stuff right and we're talking about serious. stephen belber yeah stephen belber and Great stephen belber yeah you know like this year we were planning on touring because it you know not everybody toured two years nobody toured two years ago we toured last year the understanding that I had was that everybody and their mother was going to be on the road in America this year. And so it would be so crowded that it wasn't worth touring. I wanted to avoid it. it would be hard to even get buses, you know? And uh, so my plan was always to stay out of the country this year and be touring in Europe. We were supposed to be leaving in a couple of weeks or in a week. Um, and now it's postponed. And yeah. And then, and then hopefully Southern hemisphere. So I got postponed till the fall, but that's like really a break even tour, you know, like mm -hmm. Europe and Southern hemisphere, like Australia, Japan, there's so many expenses that it's not like we're going to make a lot, but we need to do it. And we would be working. We'll still be working a lot. You know, well, I, I, that was my plan for this year. And I got an email from one of the guys in the band, like a, about a month ago that said, Hey, I just don't know if you've thought about this, but, you know, we played maybe 15 gigs in 2019. We did a full, didn't do anything in 2020. Um, we did a full tour in 2021. So that was great. And now we're planning on two tours that are just break even tours this year. That means like four out of the last five years, we will have not earned any money. And that's 
getting a little rough for some of us, you know, with expenses and stuff. And, uh, and I said, well, we can't tour the summer. Let me think about it. And, and I talked, I realized, okay, this is something where like, I'm okay because I don't have the expenses they have, you know, and I, I'm doing fine. I, well, also I make more money because of the publishing. It hadn't occurred to me. I was just thinking about keeping us busy. And I missed that there's probably a difficulty with all the kids and everything and expenses wise for the other guys. Uh, called up our manager and said, Hey, we need to find gigs, like other kinds of gigs, corporate gigs, festivals, fairs, whatever. I know we can't go on tour and I don't want to tour America this year, but we need to do some gigs. Anyways, we should make, we need to make some money because the guys need money, you know? And, and it was a situation where like, it's always been my priority and it just, I just thought about it wrong and I missed it. You know, I missed it. And it was no fault of my own. There's been a pandemic. It's not like, I'm not feeling terribly guilty about it, but I am, yeah. but I am responsible. And so yeah. as soon as we talked about it, I thought about it. I'm like, okay, I got to fix this. And now and that's so fun. interesting. And because what you're describing to someone who's not in the music business, you know, I mean, I know a little bit about it because I watched the Partridge family growing up. So I know what Ruben Kincaid would do. Um, is that what you're talking about? I thought is what the manager does and what you're saying. And I'm sure that is, yeah, that is also part of it. But I guess what you're saying is, yes, they're the ones who can book us into those venues, but I need to let my manager know, our manager know what the needs are, what we're yeah, trying to fulfill. All final decisions are me. So, yeah. you know, yes, our manager, and he's been great. He's great, you know, but uh, it was me not wanting to tour in America this year and being really mm -hmm. clear about that. And without thinking part what of that it, means for yeah can no, I, I ask you um so i knew that you and stephen belber who he steve wrote the play tape um that was adapted into a film and he wrote um match on broadway just for people uh who who have not yet been lucky enough to see a stephen belber piece but they will um there are so many musicals that are based on a collection of songs um we call them jukebox musicals sometimes um, but there are so many, you know, your songs are stories and I can't imagine you haven't been approached over the years, uh, to weave your songs into a narrative, you know, Jagged Little Pill was the Alanis Morissette version of that. Um, is that something that you have been approached about over the years? Is that something you've ever worked on? Is that what you and Steve were working on? It is no. something I get approached on every year since the beginning of forever. Mm -hmm. And I don't I don't have any interest in it I, I I love theater and so there have been good jukebox musicals Look, did you see American Idiot yes that's the, the, the two I would mention off the top of my head that I thought were very very good were Jersey Boys which I thought was a lot of fun yeah and American Idiot which I thought was absolutely brilliant yeah um, my girlfriend at the time was an American Idiot she was one of the leads in American Idiot um and uh so you yes. were so aware of sort of all of the things they went through to make sure that the band was happy and approved of it and yeah. that it worked. Yeah. And, and, it I know, and those are guys where I, uh, they were, we came out of the same place. You know, they were high school kids when I was starting in my first bands. And when I was in counting, just the beginning of counting crows, I, I, I knew them because there was a girl I knew named dynamatic, not dynamatic, but dynamatic. And her brother, Ben was, Green Day's roadie in those days when you had a roadie, like yeah. because you were, yeah. you were a band from high school with three guys and you had a roadie. Ben Maddock was their roadie. And uh, so I had been turned on to them when they were high school kids. Wow. And I, I read an article a little while ago about a guy who said he wrote, it was a whole article about Green Day, but he mentioned that the way he first got turned on to Green Day was that he came to inter interview me right at the beginning of August and everything after. And after about an hour of sitting in this cafe in Berkeley, I said to him, hey, I got to go down the hill to Sprawl Plaza. Do you mind coming with me? I got to go see this band play. You'll love them. They're amazing. And it was, they're these high school kids from Berkeley High. They're out of this world. Uh, and I took him to see Green Day. And now That's like wild. 20 years later, he was writing a career retrospective on Green Day. Wow. Uh, and I, so I knew those guys then. And I, I thought that musical was a brilliant way to like conceive of something which was halfway written as a rock opera anyways. It was kind of like a version of Tommy. Um, but no, I, the other thing, 
it just doesn't interest me. Like my, I, I, I idolize Stephen Sondheim. If I'm gonna write something for Broadway, I want it to be really good. I don't want, you know, my friend Stu and I, who we used to tour together a lot and we always talked about writing for Broadway or doing something together. And he got there first with Passing Strange. Passing Strange was brilliant, you know, and uh, he lived at my house. While he was in Passing Strange, he stayed in our guest room. Um, but, you know, like, uh, that's the kind of thing I'd like to do. Not, and what Steve and I were working on was, was a thing called Black Sun, uh, which was really cool. It was about, it was kind of like, the idea was to write like a chamber piece, like uh, some combination of magical realism and Bergman. So that it was like uh, a little night music meets the skin of our teeth, you know, or something like Gabriel Garcia, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, you know, like this idea of something that's a little surreal, which you can pull off in theater in ways you couldn't. Um, the idea was that there was something happened one day and the sun turned black and, and that changed everything but you didn't realize at first how it changed everything. It didn't actually, uh, nothing seemed to change right away at all. But what it was, was that you could kind of have whatever you wanted. And, and that worked out in different ways for different people. And it didn't always work out well. Like one guy just really wanted wings and he got them and they didn't work, but he was walking around with wings and that's tragic. You know what I mean? It was like, there were other, and they were like, it was kind of written as this three couples of three different sort of ages, three pairs of people, let's call them pairs of people, an older couple um, uh, who was like, hadn't seen each other in a long time. He, they'd had something when they were younger and he'd been gone for years and it just showed up back in New York and a younger couple. And then uh, it, it was just these really beautiful people dealing with, you know, what if you were, you know, one person maybe wanted another chance at this relationship, mm -hmm. um, but the relationship had problems, you know, and he didn't necessarily want to fix the problems. He didn't think of it that way. He wanted another chance. He got it, but that doesn't necessarily work either. You know right. what I mean? Like, Interesting. It's about how a lot of things don't work, even when you get everything you wish for, because you wish for the wrong things or mm -hmm. you want the wrong things. And it was kind of like, so the idea was to have a very small, like hurly burly group of people with a very weird macro thing going on all around them that turns out to be not quite as big and macro as you thought it was, but turns out to be very, very personal too. But it seems magical, but the magic actually operates on a very small personal level as well. And it was a really interesting play, you know? When you say like maybe one of the questions is the center, one of the things to kind of ponder is what if you wish for the wrong thing? Did you ever wish for rock stardom? Well, I think I wanted to play music and I guess I wanted to be a rock star, but there's no real way to know what that is until you're there. And I wanted to be successful. I wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to be, you know, able to do that. I wanted to spend my life doing this, which has worked out. Fame is not the same thing. I mean, I guess we all want to be popular, right? But I mean, we want everybody to like us. You don't realize how much it doesn't really work that way. Like people will hate you too. Um, you get both sides of that. There's a lot of hate, especially right. in music. Yeah, yeah, music yeah. Will pull up a lot of venom. Yeah. Because it's the thing we wear on our shirts and it's the way we define ourselves. We spend a lot of time, I'm not one of them, especially when you become successful because you may have liked the band, but you don't necessarily want to share them at the water cooler with that asshole. That guy who likes all the worst possible shit and now you got to share it with him? No, right. fuck that. Right. You know what I mean? There's a lot of ways which the kinds of people who like new bands aren't necessarily the kinds of people who like successful bands. You know, we came from college radio, you know, we were very indie rock, but then we spent a lot of years uh, trying to make up for being successful, you know, mm -hmm. trying to like defuse the venom. Um, all right. I have to let you get back to your life, although I do it hesitantly. Um, is there a little known fact that you can share about yourself before we say goodbye? Uh, I don't know. I love, love music. I mean, I am obsessed with it. I'm obsessed with, I mean, you listen to Underwater Sunshine. It's basically all about trying to like 
I find in a lot of areas of life, I lived with a lot of actors when I lived in Hollywood for 10 years almost, you know, and I lived around a lot of people who work in Hollywood who are all about what sucks. <laughs> you know, oh, that guy sucks. That's terrible. Musicians love music and they just want to shove down your throat everything they've found. Mm -hmm. They want to make you a mixtape and introduce you to all these great bands you've never heard of. That's just all they like. It's all they care about is like getting you to appreciate more music. Uh, maybe it's just because we all know that like there's so much music out there that there's no way it's almost all unappreciated. It's the saddest thing about it is that there's so much great music. It's the greatest thing about it. And it's also the saddest thing about it because I know that other than me, half the people, nobody's ever going to hear it. You know, like, so Underwater Sunshine is dedicated to shoving things we love down people's throat. Um, I don't know. I've always been obsessed with indie music. I've had two indie record companies, which is why I'm much less wealthy than I should be. Because I've had two record companies, both of which are just like sucking all the cash out of my life. Uh, I have a podcast and we run a festival, or we did before a pandemic tore it apart. Um, and I love... I love the theater I, because I think it's, it's very close to what I do. The fact that they have to go there and do it every night. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Well, one of my best friends in the whole world for 30, 33 years now uh, is Mary Louise Parker. Um, we met when we were kids, I was in my first band. And she was uh, straight, just graduated from uh, North Carolina School for the Arts. And she was in Berkeley. She'd made one movie uh, called Signs of a Life for uh, American Playhouse. And she was in Berkeley doing Prelude to a Kiss at Berkeley Rep um, before it eventually went to Broadway and was her first real Broadway show. Um, yeah. Um, but we dated for 24 hours about maybe less maybe maybe uh and we've been like we're born a day apart and we've been best friends ever since then um like she's like another side of me or the sister the other sister i didn't have um i'm one day older than her and there is a scene in signs of life that first movie i say this because i saw it in the movie theaters when it first came out and a few months later i saw it and i was trying to figure out a name for my band at that point and there's a scene i had up legal pad with two full columns so that's about 60 terrible names um terrible terrible names that should never be any band's name and i was trying to think of band names and i was watching signs of life and uh which was originally called one for sorrow two for joy by the way the original title of that movie and there's a scene where vince d'onofrio and kevin j o'connor are standing on a hillside trying to figure out what to do with the rest of their lives and vince says a flock of crows flies up and Vince says to Kevin, what was that nursery rhyme your grandmother used to tell us about counting crows? And Kevin says, ah, I think it was counting dogs. And, uh, and I thought, oh, that's my band name, Counting Crows. Awesome. I wrote it down, crumbled up a piece of paper and threw it in my parents' fireplace. Had to be over their house watching. It. And uh, that's how we got our name. Adam, thank you for being on the show today. This has been such an immense pleasure. Thank you for being thank so you. generous with your time and yourself. And thank you for your beautiful, beautiful music for all of these years. And here's to many more in the future. Okay. Thank you. Say hi to Don. I will. All, all right. right. Hang Thanks. on. Let me make sure we got it.